In a world of uncertainty, how can you future-proof your skill set? Welcome to Choose FI. All right, guys, really excited to dive into this week's episode. A um, lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. A lot of uncertainty, a lot of industries being upturned and just we don't know exactly what's coming, what's going to come back. We just don't know with the shifting landscape around us how to best prepare ourselves. There's just too many variables. So I thought we could slow down and we could talk about for us as, you know, as adults, but also for those of us with families, with kids, how can we ensure that we are future-proofing our lives and how can we best help our kids future-proof their lives when maybe they don't, you know, they're, they're wondering, you know, they're trying to, we're trying to create an environment that maybe 10 years from now, they're going to thrive as an adult. And we're just trying to shortcut that learning curve and make it a little bit less painful. Very excited about this and help me with this. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I am doing quite well. And yeah, this is this is interesting because I think this future proofing and these building skills, it's so important. And I know for myself, like when I was growing up, I didn't think about entrepreneurship at all. It had never, ever crossed my mind. It was just go to school, get into a great college, get a great job, and work for 50 years, right? Like that was that was a successful life. And it's interesting as we get more and more into this FI mindset, right? Because that's what it is. It's a mindset. That entire concept has shifted for me. And especially now that I have kids who are really growing up and becoming humans of their own, who have their own thoughts, ideas, and friends, and, and just all different interests. It's It's cool to see them think about this. And I think part of it has become hey, dad is doing this, right? And we talk about business. We had the simple startup workbook that we brought into the house. And I did a couple of lessons with, with Anna and Molly. And, and really, Molly was the one who, who just loved it. She's, she's my little one, my eight-year-old. And, and it's actually, Jonathan, I didn't tell you about this, but it's, it's been really cool this last week because Molly and her friend Sophie have decided to start a business which is, is really, really neat. And it, it's cool because it ties into what we talked about last Friday Roundup, episode 269, which was basically, what if 2020 was your best year ever? What if you reframed it mentally, right? And part of seeing these kids have this virtual school from, from the house, you know, I think my reflexive response was, oh, this isn't going to be good. This is going to be, just less than in some way. I think we've now looked at it and said, hey, what if this is the best thing that ever happened to them? What if they look back on this time period in 2020 as the best three, five, seven, whatever m number of months that it ultimately is of virtual school? What if that's the best school they ever had? And I think, Jonathan, I think there's a reasonable chance that is how they look back on this. I know just to paint you a picture here of, of Molly's day, it's like, it's talk about living your best life. So she goes to school in her bedroom on her computer. She has school for about two hours and then they have recess and five of them descend on their bikes onto our driveway and they ride around for 30 minutes. Then they go back to school for another hour and then they have lunch at one of the five kids' houses. and. Then they have another hour of, of school and then it's riding bikes for the next four hours and playing and exploring. And again, like that sounds to me like Molly's best possible life. I mean, she is just thriving and doing well at school in the process. So it's not like, oh, it's just about playtime, but, but I guess to bring it all back to entrepreneurship here. So, uh, the, the other week, this was last week, Molly and Sophie decided that they wanted to clean out one of our garden beds. Okay. Just on their own volition, they wanted to make it like their little, their little play area. So, I mean, they spent no joke, three plus hours, like meticulously cleaning this out, weeding, getting rid of all the, the debris and mulch and excess stuff. And I'm looking at it from the window here. It's in the front yard. It is still gorgeous. Like it's picture perfect. They put these little like fairy gardens in there and like hung an American flag. It's just like the cutest thing in the world. And, and they actually came to me. So Molly came to me and she's like, we're thinking about starting a business of 
like being landscapers. Like, and and this is so cute. It's like two little eight-year-old girls, and they like they wanted to start a business to help other people do this type of cleaning. And it, it was, you know, obviously Jonathan, I can uh, I can go into the whole story, but but yeah, it was really just neat to see like that was their first thought. And I wonder, I really wonder if that would have been her thought four months ago before she was even introduced to the simple startup. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think you need to have a framework for it. You need to have seen someone else uh, do it. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs have maybe other business owners or entrepreneurs in the family. You need to see the behavior model. And sometimes it just takes kind of one person lowering the barrier of entry and saying, okay, great entrepreneurship. But entrepreneurship, it, you know, every business is comprised of these 10 different things. What if we could just walk you through that? And then now I, everybody thinks it's the idea. No, it's the framework. The idea can be substituted. The idea leads to the next idea, leads to the next idea. You have the framework, the core principles, the framework. You start noticing, observing problems or intersections of zones of interest and passion and opportunity. And over time, you like you 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 try different things. And so the key is not for us to like make sure they have the one idea that just works and becomes this massive thing, but rather they understand the framework for building a business as quickly as possible. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and that was the cool thing. So we sat down and we just, we talked it through. Like she said, daddy, I really want to talk about how would I start a business? Like what, what would this look like? You know, how would we try to get people to hire us? And, you know, I was really very, very open and honest with her about this is like, okay, Molly, like, let's really think this through. Like, are you saying that, that you two eight-year-old girls are going to be landscapers? Like, what if somebody said like, Hey, can you take down this tree? Like, can you do that? You know, are you going to mow lawns? Like, no. Right. And, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But like, you need to just, and this is not throwing like uh, cold water or whatever the saying is on this at all. It was the exact opposite. It was trying to like really hone down into what is their offering. And, you know, they very specifically, there are a lot of things they cannot do, but man, they can clear out a garden bed like the best of them. So, and, you know, then it was, let's talk through this. Like, do you want to maybe build these fairy gardens or do you want to decorate these beds? Like, is that something you want to consider? And she wasn't too interested in it, which, which is absolutely fine. Like that's, that's perfectly cool. Cause she's like, you know, they might not, they might not really want this fairy garden. They might not it might cost too much. It might, you know, all these things, but she was thinking it through. And then it was, okay, who is going to hire eight-year-old girls and what, how are they going to pay them? Like, how do you want, how do you want to charge for this? Like, are you going to charge, we want to, we're going to charge $30 to clear out a garden bed. Well, what happens if the garden bed is the entire front yard? Like, do you have some flexibility? And it was, you know, again, I'm just kind of feeding her very general questions to just help her think through it. I wasn't trying to lead her in any direction, uh, but it was just neat to just sit down with my daughter on the couch and just really think about this. And I think, you know, that, I don't know if this, they, they came up with a cool little nickname. They're, they're going to be the gardening gals, which I thought was awesome. That's awesome. But, um, you know, in all honesty, I don't know if this is ever going to come to fruition, but it really doesn't matter. That that's That's the takeaway for me is like, I suspect strongly, like just having that conversation with Molly is going to help seed the next time they have an idea. Or I don't know if that's six months from now, six years from now, or 20 years from now, but when she goes to start up some venture, she, she has that conversation in mind, that thought process in mind. And I think that's where a lot of what we talk about here, like it's building a skill set of, Hey, how do I, how do I get new clients? Like they, they, decorated these cool signs. And I'm like, you know, where are you going to put those in a neighborhood that doesn't have like a central gathering spot? Like, are you going to put them in people's mailboxes? Are you going to put a sign up on our front yard? Like all of these different things you need to think about. And it's just, it's just building a skill set, but really it's building a mindset. I love this man. Yeah. I think, uh, it, you could make the case that 70% of the population is never going to be an entrepreneur. Right. I and mean, that's probably, that's probably a very, very conservative estimate. It's probably much higher than that. 80%, 90%, something like that. The vast majority of the population is never going to be an entrepreneur in the pure sense of the word where they have their own business. But 
I would say that going into the future, all of us, 100% of us need to be thinking like an entrepreneur because an entrepreneur is an umbrella term that covers all of these other skills that you need to incorporate. And it allows you to find opportunities that they may not match up one-to-one with what your degree is, but because you have evidence of what you have built or what skills you have built that allowed you to do various aspects of this, it makes it way easier for you to bridge the gap. And just in this tiny little example, Brad, that you were laying out, we talked about, you know, marketing, design, pricing, starting to evaluate your break-even point and narrowing down on your niche, what is the actual service that you offer? Uh, and I think parents, you know, I, I guess we say future-proof your ki- uh, your skills from the kids edition, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at it right now. Um, if you're looking for a way to connect with your kids and have better, more meaningful conversations about something, and, and right now you're asking them what they did and it's just video games, you know, and you're like, I just don't know how to, I don't know how to, I don't know how to bridge that. If Imagine your ability to take what you've learned up to this point and help them as they start to develop and future-proof these actual skills. You might learn something in the process. Um, frameworks for these types of conversations are incredibly valuable and will carry with them into everything else that they tackle going forward. Um, Brad, I thought what we could do, so, you know, we always talk about the simple startup on, on this show and, uh, Rob Phelan is rolling out his next opening for that course in January of this year. You can get, you can find more information if you want to register, uh, your, your kids or your young adult, if you want to register them at, uh, chooseify.com slash startup. Uh, there is still some availability and it does typically sell out. So if you're interested, make sure uh, you take advantage of that. Uh, but what I thought we could do is actually bring on a, a share with you guys, a segment that we recorded with a graduate of the simple startup program. Her name is Annalise. She was one of the younger students to join Rob and go through this program. She was a little hesitant at first. It was encouraged by her mom and Annalise crushed it. I mean, absolutely thrived in this. And she just wanted to share a little bit about what she did and why she did it and what she got out of it. So for those of you that are wondering, you know, what, what does it look like? What do you, should I really be teaching, a, you know, having an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old uh, go through an entrepreneurship boot camp? Does that make sense? I think either, you know, because of the conversation that we've just shared with you, or certainly at the end of the segment, you'll have a greater appreciation for that. So if you give me just a second, I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up. All right, everyone. Well, we're super excited. We're gonna be speaking uh, with Annalise, who is the founder and CEO of Creative Car Designs. She's also nine years old. And her mom, Andrea, who enrolled her in the Simple Startup Program. We are going to be pulling out a little bit about her business, what she has created, and some lessons learned. And we're going to do a little business coaching. It's just going to be a lot of fun. And again, Annalise, you are the youngest participant on Choose FI to date. You are a a second generation FI case study here, an entrepreneur in the making, not even an aspiring entrepreneur, an actual entrepreneur. And we are so excited to welcome you to the show. So Annalise, welcome to Choose a Fi. Thank you. You are welcome. All right. Tell me about your company. What, what's the name of your company again for our audience? Creative Card Designs. How did you come up with that name? Because they are supposed to be like personalized cards that are fun, that people would want to send to someone else to just say hello, or on occasions like birthdays and thank you cards. So these are personalized. Are you actually, are you personally hand drawing them for people? Yes, I am. Okay. Draw each one. Very cool. Oh, wow. Do you have like a certain number of different type of cards that you draw or do do people ask for, hey, I want a birthday card and I want there to be, I don't know, a flamingo on it or something. Like, can you draw anything or are there only a certain number of things? They can do that, but I have made some designs that you can pick from and then I can make a message on the inside like happy birthday or something like that. But you can also choose your own design for me to draw on the front. So the name of our company is Creative Card Designs, founded by Annalise. What is your mission statement? What is your company's mission? To connect people by making quality, personalized cards for different occasions. Very cool. Now, this is a real business. How many cards have you sold? So far, I've sold two because I'm trying to keep it slower right now. Yes. But soon, I'm going to try to make it bigger because it's hard sometimes to keep drawing them. Like I'm trying to move it more digital now and just drawing each one on 
an app where you can just draw it and then printing them out so I can just personalize them still but make it easier for me. So if I make a mistake, I, I can just undo it. This is awesome. So you're already thinking about scale now. So you're saying, okay, I can make, it takes a long time to make one. What would it look like if I have people knocking on my doors trying to buy a hundred? How can I yeah. streamline and speed up my workflow? So tell me, to get to the point where we're now able to sell our first two and we've confirmed that people do want this for a price, what are the skills that you have learned? So I got the idea. I started doing the business and then I was coming up with different designs to put on the front of cards. So then I started designing them. So I just made those designs and then I'm printing them out. So then I have a website and a form so that people can order the cards and I can just access it from my Gmail so I can quickly make their cards. Well, I am going to order a card today. I'll, I'll, I'll come back on the end, but I'm literally going to finish this call and order a card. So you'll have to share with us the website at the end of this conversation so that we can all go order a card. Now, what would you do if this episode went live and you got 50 orders for cards? What would happen? I might have to try to figure out even more quickly how to do it on an app and quickly print it from there. And it might take slightly longer to get the card to the person because I'd have to figure out how I would be doing things and then get it to them. That's cool. Annalise, I, I'm curious. So you were having issues with some of the drawing. You were going through your materials. Do you have any any idea of maybe like how much money, like once you've got all that figured out, like how much each card would cost you? And also tell the audience like what you're currently charging people for a card. So I guess ultimately, like how much money are you making on each one? I think I'm making about $2 for each card and I'm charging about $5 for each card. But if I'm moving it more digital, so that makes it slightly easier, I might drop the prices because it'll be easier for me to make each card. That's cool. And yeah, like Jonathan always says, you can test out a lot of different things, which is neat, right? Like, especially once you do get it, so it's it's more automated and maybe the, the price to you drops, you can test out, like maybe that $5 is the right price, or maybe you could test out at $4 or who knows, like it might be six or $7 people might be willing to spend. So yeah. it's neat that with a business, especially like you said at the beginning, you want to start out slow. You're trying yeah. to figure this out and you might not the very first time just by sheer luck have hit on the perfect price. Like you can test different things, which is a lot of people don't realize. I think if, if they really thought about it, they would realize that they could test it, but, but they don't actually put that into action. They just say, oh, that's the price. It's $5. It's always been that way. But the cool thing is you can always test that out. So definitely keep that, keep that in the back of your mind. So this is a really cool business that you've made. What got you thinking about starting a business? Well, I thought it would be so starting a business would be good because I can make some extra money. And also it's good to learn how to take control of your own things and not have to always be working under someone else and have to follow exactly what they say to do. So you can be your own boss. Are you a good boss? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, your mom is on this call with us. Andrea, we've kept you waiting in the wings. How's your daughter done so far? <laughs> Oh, she's done well. Um, we've taken it at a good pace. You know, none of it has been too overwhelming at any points. And then as school starts up, she's, you know, been able to take a little bit of a backseat with it, but she's been enjoying it along the way, which was the most important part, you know, that you, she enjoys the journey and that she's learning it, guiding it herself, doing what, you know, turning her interest into something because that's what's in the end going to keep her more motivated. Is it something she's created? It's something she gets to see her own idea become a reality into some type of business. So it's been really nice and she's been doing well and definitely added a lot to her learning and her knowledge base. Yeah, that is so cool. I mean, to be able to work with your daughter on building a business, right? Watching her grow and thrive at nine years old. I mean, that's that's remarkable. And, and just to take a quick step back. So uh, this is The Simple Startup. So at thesimplestartup.com is where people can get Rob's uh, workbook, which is a beginner's guide to starting a business. And I know I've went through this, the, the early chapters with my daughters and just seeing the ideas spark in their brains was just like, 
it was such a cool thing to spend that time with them. And I mean, when would they otherwise be introduced to entrepreneurship at that age? And it, it was just a neat thing. And you took it a step further, right? And you actually signed Annalise up for the camp that Rob was offering. And actually, he's continuing to offer these camps. They've been such a success that he's going to offer them during the year, which is very cool. But uh, you signed Annalise up for the first, the actual summer camp, right? Yes. Yes. I signed her up for the summer camp. And yet, to your point about, you know, their spark of interest, I even remember myself being a child and seeing, you know, some of her friends, they do have so much interest and these ideas come up, but sometimes they just don't have any guidance or what to do with them. And so sometimes they try on their own. Sometimes the ideas fall by the wayside. But in this case, to know this is a platform, this is a way where the, the, the students are having a way to, you know, continue on with their ideas. They're receiving the support and the guidance as to what to do with them. And that's not something, you know, I may not be able to give her that. I may not know, you know, some of these skills. And so to have someone who is able to guide them along that path, I thought was so valuable for students and, you know, when they have these wonderful ideas. So Annalise, when you started this class, was this your own, was it always, I'm going to do cards or did you have to come up with, did you have several ideas when you started or did you have any ideas well, when you started? When I started, I had some ideas, but it was actually a huge thing with my ideas because I was torn between a few of them and I'm like, oh no, I don't know what to do. So I came to my classmates and Rob for help and they gave me good advice and I used it and it helped me move along. How was the virtual classroom setting with your classmates? Did Were you able, like you said, they actually helped you. Were they able to help workshop your exact idea? Well, once I had my card idea and I knew I was going to be using it, then I showed them my cards and they gave me feedback like, oh, your handwriting, like maybe you should change it to center it more and, you know, make it neater. So I used that and I realized it was kind of hard sometimes to be using my own handwriting so I typed it online, then printed it out, and then I drew the design on it. Let me ask you this. If someone were to ask you, how do I make a business? How do I start a business? If one of your friends at school were to say, how do I, Annalise, I know you have this business and I know you're selling cards. How do I make a business? What would you tell them? I tell them that first you have to come up with an idea that would actually work. So you'd have to ask other people because it has to be something that people would want. So you don't spend all this time making something and then realize that no one actually wants it. And then you have to come up with something that will be profitable. Like you can't just spend all your money on something. And then again, like I said before, realize that no one wants it. So then you just spend all that money and now you can't make it back. And I tell them that you have to keep working hard on things. If you want to have a business, just don't give up like very quickly because then you can't actually have it. So you need to keep working hard to actually be successful. And Elise, I think that some pe- a lot of people love the idea of starting their own business, but this idea of failure is so scary. Like what if it fails that they just don't ever get started? And I'm curious for you, having gone through this process, are you scared of failure at this point? No, not really. Explain that. What, what does that mean for you? Have you tried anything that didn't work? Yeah. Like, Again, drawing out the designs, and then I realized that I was spending all my money on my materials, and I hadn't really made any sales, so I needed to figure out another way for it. So I just solved my problem, tried to solve it. Oh, that is so cool, right? And then I realized, dot, dot, dot. That's what she's saying here, right? And then I realized, and Annalise, like you're saying, you might have had this perfect idea in your head. But the cool thing about life in general and certainly owning a business and running a business is, and then I realized, right, I got new information and I had to make a little change or a pivot, we might call it, right? So a lot of people get really stuck when they view there's something bad that happened. There's some adversity, right, that they have to overcome. A lot of people, unfortunately, adults see that and they stop. Whereas you said, and then I realized, and then I made some little changes. And that's one of the fun parts about making your own business and and life in general is you're going to have to find interesting ways around things and come up with, you know, we all have these wonderful, intelligent brains that we can think, you know, and we can come up with different ways. And 
I love your takeaways with just starting the business, right? Like, what did you do? You found out like, hey, is there a market for this? That's the question you asked yourself. Like, will anybody actually buy this? Do people want it, right? Is it going to make a profit? Because clearly you're not going to want to spend all this time and effort on something if there's no profit there, right? You don't want to have this razor thin, like I'm going to sell it for $4.99 and I'm going to, it's going to cost me $4.97 to make. That would make no sense, right? And then you also said, and I, I love this, is you're working hard, right? I mean, that's one of the keys to success in life is you've come up against these issues. Everything wasn't perfect, but you made changes because you were willing to work through it. And 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 again, the final lesson that, that I've picked up, and thank you so much for just what you've taught me already, is like you started small, right? You weren't you weren't saying, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy ten thousand cards, I'm gonna write them all out, and then I'm gonna even address them. Like I'm gonna make up fake names and put them like that would be silly, right? Like you started small because then there's no downside. You bought some paper. I'm sure there was some cost to that, obviously, but it wasn't like you spent hundreds or thousands of dollars, right? This was pretty inexpensive to start small. And then you can make changes so much easier, like you've already done. So thank you for what you've passed along. And certainly we're not, we're not letting you go with that. But that is you know, just the, the four things that I picked up from you already. Mom, I'd love to talk to you just a little bit more. So Andrea, uh, I'm just curious, if you were to think about the skill set that you're watching your daughter build in front of you over a period of several weeks, what is the biggest mindset shift that you've seen in her as you've had a chance to work with her through these projects and as you've seen you know, Rob and her team uh, help her kind of shape her idea? I would say definitely a sense of enablement in a sense that she can actually do it, that she's seeing her self come up with an idea and she's able to take that idea all the way through and watch it grow. And the idea that things aren't necessarily always simple or easy, but learning to persist and persist is what gets you that success and getting gets you where you want to be. Sometimes, right, when she was making the cards and she would you know, make a mistake on one and then have to do it over, then she may almost be done with the design, but then she has to do it over. It was tough. It wasn't an easy moment for her. But as frustrated as she may have gotten, she knew this is an obstacle I just have to get past. I'd love for you to talk just for a couple minutes about the actual, from your from your perspective as a parent, the actual uh, simple startup camp that that the virtual camp that Annalise enrolled in. You know, what was your assessment of how it was run and uh, the value proposition there for maybe a parent that's saying, "Oh, wow, maybe my student, my maybe my child could benefit from an entrepreneurship camp." It was a great value proposition. It actually was definitely much more than I would have expected at the beginning. Initially, I wasn't quite sure what to expect from the camp. Um, I thought it had great potential, but I hadn't actually seen the camp yet. Um, But the fact that it was virtual was one of actually the things that made me more inclined to do it. Because first, everything is virtual at the moment. But secondly, it was kind of a low pressure situation. You know, she could go into it, it's virtual, and we'll see what happens. And then, the camp itself, the one of the greatest things about it was first the knowledge that was given. It was so comprehensive. They focused on so many details and so many aspects of running a business from your ideas, from setting it up, from the mechanics of it, making a logo, making a website, pricing your product. So those mechanics, and even going back to the idea, the fact that to come up with your initial idea, they brought up so many techniques that had the student really focus on what they liked and what they wanted to pursue. And she did something called mind mapping, which asked her to assess herself and assess where her strengths, her resources, her likes, and where all where a lot of those things came together and into a business idea. And just to ask a a student to have such level of self-awareness, to look at themselves and see where they fit into everything and where they would fit into a business they want to start. I thought that was a really wonderful thing because sometimes some adults don't even get a chance to really self-reflect and be self-aware and to know who you are going into something. Um, But from the beginning, she was given techniques like that. And I know she really took that to heart and really enjoyed it. I remember her putting out all her post-it notes with the different categories out on her area and combining them all into the proper groupings to come up with her business ideas. So it was really nice to give someone a chance to reflect on themselves like that. And a lot of the virtual lessons, even the ones that were on video, 
there were always actionable pieces and there were calls to actions. You would take a break and it would say, please complete this. And so you weren't just sitting there as a passive learner. She was always an active participant throughout the entire thing. And then having the support of Rob, you know, in the live format and she was always accessible via email. So never at any point did she ever sit there and feel like after putting her good effort into something that she was stuck and there was just nowhere to turn. And I'm just not going to be able to solve that. She had the community of her peers to reach out to on the Google Classroom, and she had Rob to reach out to. And every time she did, she received wonderful you know, help, really actionable things, really realistic and good responses. And so having that community support and the support of Rob was another thing that made the camp so valuable, even along with things like the workbook. The workbook has all the information out in front of you. It's another way you're seeing it, you're doing it, you're writing things down when you're planning it out. And that was the other great thing. Just the nature of creating a business asks you to plan it out. You have a business snapshot. You have to sit there and focus on the, the different aspects of your business and the, how they're going to work together. It's not, oh, today I feel like I'm going to draw a card and it will be fun. Yes, it will. But how does that interact with the pricing? This card that you're making, how does it connect to the responses you received from your target market survey? And even the mechanics of that, I know she found very enjoyable. She loved making the surveys and getting feedback from people, I guess, just becoming part of something. What she saw her business that she was creating, when people would give her advice or feedback, it's almost like she's seeing a community, a small community develop around this business. So um, all of those aspects of the camp, I didn't necessarily expect or know that was happening, but they were huge and they really made a difference and they helped you know, her stick with it and her progress to where she did. So it was just a wonderful journey in so many respects. Yeah, that is so cool. I become a part of something, right, Andrea? That's what you said. And I mean, that sounds to me like a mastermind group, an accountability <laughs> group, right? Like that's, that's in <laughs> essence what you're describing. How cool is essentially, that? Yes. <laughs> essentially, yes. Essentially, yes. I, I would say it was. It was, uh, it was, it was on her level, but it, but it certainly was. And I mean, even with the community, just the energy they would get from each other. I know when Annalise would check the Google Classroom, sometimes she would tell myself, oh, you know, one of the other people made a sale and, or look, look what they're making when people would put up their products. And it was just the variety of ideas, the skills people had, I think it was also just an eye opener to be like, yes, people can do this, you know? And if you ever wanted to pursue something like that, yeah, just like they did, you can find out how to do it and do it. It was just such a great synergy. And I would say it it was very much a a mastermind group of sorts. (laughs) That's That's so great. All right. There's more to extract from this and we'll, we'll, we'll make kind of a final point here, but I just wanted to say, uh, Annalise, just to you, kind of this next phase, there's a lot of things going on. You've actually got a business. You're starting to get sales. You're moving more into the concept and design and production and now into the marketing piece. All right, I've got this. I can do this at this price. I can make this profit. My model works. Now I need to get it in front of more people. Once I have it in front of more people, I need to evaluate, do all those processes that I just built. Do they still work at scale? If you got an order for 50 cards when this episode goes live, could you handle that? That's an open question. You need to think through that. Am I priced the right way? If I couldn't handle that, but I know if I price right now, I'm priced at five ninety nine. I know that because I've been able to market myself, and there's a much larger audience that's aware of what I'm doing, that I could probably maybe I'd have less orders, but I'd be able to fulfill them faster at six ninety nine, eight ninety nine, or nine ninety nine. And yes, that's higher end of the market. But I'm not making a card for everybody. I'm making a card for people who connect with my mission and my idea and my story. Then maybe you would only get twenty five offers, but your profit margin would be such that you do less cards, you make more profit and you're like, well, maybe now my new price is closer to eight ninety nine or seven ninety nine, somewhere in that range. These are the things you have to, you have to go through. But what I wanted to say is the, that's the business side. The other aspect that I want you not to lose, and you've already done this once is that mind map, that self-awareness, you know, something about yourself right now, but now you also have not just what you think about yourself, but what you've actually been able to do. You have a business, you've done this, you've worked on every aspect of the business, the marketing sales, the design, the execution, the process, you're starting to build your own personal talent stack. And I would suggest to you, as you start to move into adulting, you become a teenager and then you're applying for college, maybe you're getting your first job. The skills that you're building right now are like life skills. They unlock the universe. 
your ability to help a future employer think through the same process that you did on your business is very valuable. Your ability to communicate to the college, your awareness of what you can do, your strengths, where you excel in this actual business that you created unlocks scholarship potential. It unlocks job applications. It unlocks everything if you can tell a story around what you've actually done. You've already done it, so don't lose that. Capture it, make notes. Every application gets easier that you ever fill out going forward because of this work and this, this process that you actually went through. There is no scholarship that's off limits to you when you've done something like this. It's just, it's incredible. So I just wanted to, I wanted to point that out. Now, I get very excited for you. I'm very excited about the next <laughs> several years, as you can tell. But what I really am excited for is to buy a card. Where would I go if I wanted to buy one of your cards? You'd go to my website, which is creativecarddesigns.wordpress.com. And on my website, I have different I show you my cards so that you can choose what you want to order. And then you go to a Google form, which is attached in my website. And then you can um, choose what you want. And I will get back to you very quickly. All right. Nice. Let me sit, let me double check and make sure I have it right. Creativecarddesigns.wordpress.com. Is that correct? Yes. Cool. And then I'm on the site and I see the order and I see the Google form and then I assume at some point you would ask for payment. Yes. Do you take like PayPal or Venmo? How do you how do you accept payment? For now, I do Venmo. Okay. Very very cool. So yeah, that's creativecarddesigns.wordpress.com. So yeah, this is this is really really cool. I can't wait to see how many card orders you get from this podcast. That's one thing that. Rob really modeled so well during the camp, right? At least he was always coming up with solutions. And sometimes we'd be like, wow, like how did he, and just to get into that mode of thinking, you know, saying, I will find a way, like, what are, what are the possibilities? How could we do this? And sometimes it was just amazing for her to watch him and even myself to hear some of the things, you know, if I was hearing in the background of what he was saying, I was like, oh, wow, that's some great thinking. Like, <laughs> it's so creative. And just to be able to know, you know, right, learning is not, oh, learn these facts and recite them back. Learning is, oh, like, flex your creative muscle, problem solve how you need to problem solve and get get things done. That's a, such a wonderful form of learning and so valid and so useful. The younger one can start it and start thinking that way. It just becomes a habit. It just becomes, this is the way the world is. And if you want to get something done, this is how you do it. And it becomes natural and that's invaluable. And it's not something you always learn. Brad, that was inspiring, right? You could see it's not that she has a completed product or that her business is taking over the world at this point, but she has a clear path forward and she's got the mindset now that was a totally a foreign language just maybe several weeks ago. Yeah. And that's, that is what this is all about, right? I mean, I, I don't imagine that Annalise is going to be doing this. 20 years from now, but hey, you never know, first off. And second off, she is is learning these skills, right? Like even just how can I produce all of these? Like, can I continue to do this by hand? Do I need to make it digital? Do I, how much do I charge? Like all of these things. It's just, it's building this mindset for, okay, maybe this business turns out to be a huge success. That would be wonderful, obviously but it's laying the groundwork for that next business, the one following that, who knows, like when you're eventually gonna, gonna hit that success. And I mean, Jonathan, just thinking about like my own entrepreneurial journey, like, I mean, I, I probably had, I think, I don't know the exact count, but something like seven or eight businesses and over a 10 year period that frankly, all of them at the time just looked like a complete failure, but it laid the groundwork for what eventually became Richmond Savers, which was a reasonable success, which became Travel Miles 101, which was a bigger success, and then led ultimately to Choose FI. Like there is a direct line there. If it wasn't for those first seven that I picked up skills, I picked up knowledge, I picked up, frankly, things not to do, none of the good things would have happened. So I think for a lot of us, like it's very, it's fleetingly rare that you're going to be a massive entrepreneurial success on your first try. Like that's, it's so incredibly rare, but you're almost, you're signing up for this journey. And I think that's, that's part of the fun. I mean, this is, this is life, right? Like we're here to learn things. We're here to enjoy ourselves. We're here to struggle. Frankly, that's a significant part of life and overcoming those struggles. There is great value in that. 
And I think that's part of it, Brad. I think with almost everything else that we do, we don't expect to get it right the first time. When we're in school, we don't expect it just to be completely easy. We're going to have to lean in. We're going to have to learn. We're going to have to be bad at it before we're good at it. That's why we're there to learn. But then with entrepreneurship, if we just get it, if we don't get it exactly perfect, if it doesn't exactly work, then we're just saying, oh, we're a failure. We're not a good entrepreneur. You know, we don't give ourselves the same grace that we give ourselves with school to say, hey, I'm here in school for four years to learn this skill. But, you know, the first time you attempt something on your own, you're like, oh, I'm just a failure. I'm not good at this. Like, we've just got to, we got to, we got to get rid of that. I mean, you're living now in the future where you can teach yourself anything and the things that you learn can be based on your interest. This is just an unparalleled opportunity. If you have the right mindset, we did a follow-up with Annalise. We just got this voicemail from her today. Excited to share with you what her perspective is on where she is now and where she's going. I'm going to play that for you right now. Hi, Brad and Jonathan. It's me, Annalise, from Creative Card Designs. Thank you again for inviting me on the podcast. I wanted to give you an update on my business. I have moved my designs digital to make it easier for me to draw them. Since the podcast, I've contacted more people about my business, and I have doubled my orders. Thanks again. Brad, she might be doing this 10 years from now. I have a feeling it'll be Annalise Designs, and it'll span a whole range of products, but um, that is growth right there. That is amazing. Several weeks ago. Yeah, and just a few short weeks since we spoke with her the first time, and it's amazing to see her really take this stuff and take action, right? And pivot and go out and find new customers. Like, I mean, this is just awesome. Annalise, you're amazing. Really a huge congrats. And you know, this is about, this is about immersion. You have to be interested. You have to look for it. But once you get started, it's not hard and it's, it's engaging. It's better than any board game. It's better than any video game. It's, 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 it can be interest led learning with a clear outcome in mind. And what's cool about it is when you get started and it's not working just because you're trying, you can start to get immediate feedback from people that are one or two steps ahead of you saying, especially if you're looking for that type of feedback, you can say, well, this isn't working. Does anybody have any suggestions? And they'll, and you know, those individuals will say, yeah, well, you know, they, the ground that you're digging right now, that's all, that's very rocky. But if you just move over a few feet, you pivot your idea just a little bit and you try this, it's going to be so much easier. And based on what I've seen, you're going to get way better results. And so now because you tried and failed, because you tried and it was hard, you're immediately able to now start getting actual feedback on how to iterate and hone your idea. Maybe, uh, maybe Molly's initial idea was we're going to do landscaping and they're going to do uh, masonry and they're going to come bring rocks in and do paver gardens. I like the way those look. And then they realize I'm an eight year old, you know, 60 pound girl. Uh, I can't even lift one of these. That idea is not going to work. We need to hone our business model down. And we're saying, all right, you know, we're going to do this fairy garden and we're going to, we're going to clean, we're going to weed and trim, you know, your shrubs and we're going to do the mulch a little bit and we're going to arrange some special elements in there. And then you're like, okay, that's our idea. Now, how are we going to market this? All right. So now they're looking into that and they find out, well, we can use our phone to take pictures and then we can do a few graphics and we can create some flyers. We can print those out. We can drop them in our neighborhood. And then, well, is there a way, how are we going to accept payment? And now you're going down the rabbit hole of, all right, we're going to set up Stripe or we're going to set up, you know, some sort of square so that we can just, they can just swipe their card at the door to make it easier. They can put their order in online. Then we're going to set up our email list because once someone purchases the shrubbery once, that's not just a one and done. You need it to be maintained. So you have bookings. Hey, it's that time of year. We're doing your block. We're going to be on your street. We offer a discount if we're doing it all at the same time. We do. We only have this space out of school. So we try to group all of our service during this window. And if you sign up during this time, you can get an extra 20% discount that sort of thing. Right. And then you, now you've been able to get a perpetual revenue stream that's being baked and you're doing this, you've designed your lifestyle, right? Cause your side hustle takes place in these specific gaps you've created you and your friend. And, um, then you can put some savings goals around that. Right. So no, it's no longer mom and dad giving you an allowance because they were only giving you a few bucks a week. Anyways, we're making hundreds of dollars, you know, hundred, literally hundreds of dollars. And, uh, we're, adding all of this to our stack. So now when you're, you know, applying for jobs and now when you're applying to college and they're wanting something extra on the resume, you talk about how you took this little idea and you scaled it to something that was making several thousand dollars a year and not even just the revenue that it generated, but the actual, uh, business components that went into it. Some of these skills that you actually built this, what have you done? becomes very easy on every scholarship application, on every job application. You start using the language that the schools and the businesses are actually looking for. Maybe this gets you a full scholarship, you know, because there's a level of creativity 
um, that you've demonstrated based on what have you done? Not would you what you would like to do, but you've actually done, even if you didn't do it that good, because you were learning as you went. Was it that good or that well, Brad? I feel like that pulled me off the rails a little bit. <laughs> 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 we're going to proceed. Uh, but <laughs> this body of what you have done just kind of carries you into every single adventure, and and you realize the that the, there's not a fear of failure. There's embracing that because there is no, there's no failure when you're talking about entrepreneurship. There's just iterating your idea and failing forward or pivoting into the next idea. It's massive for a kid to realize that. It's massive for you to realize that. Um, if you have been feeling just trapped in an industry, in a job, in just kind of this rote task that you're doing over and over again, you feel unappreciated, uninspired, and you're looking for the exit it might require that you add some new skills to your talent stack. It might require, but you don't need to wait for college to give you permission or to get a degree. It might be a good idea just for you to think about life through the lens of entrepreneurship. And then what skills could you add that would be helpful? Because if you're not an entrepreneur, you're almost by initiation helping an entrepreneur at some level. And they have needs as well. If you can understand that, life opens up. If you feel uninspired, why wouldn't this work for you? Brad, this is what we see all the time. Like this is not, this is not to be the exception to the rule. This is actually the rules of life. And people that listen to our show that take action on these ideas, like this inspires them. And I love how in many cases they actually end up just sharing with us what they're actually doing and, and what they're working through. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I mean, this to me is one of the most gratifying parts of now what, what I'm doing at Choose of I, which is to a large degree is manning, manning our email. Like I love this. Honestly, like it, it is just so wonderful to read these stories, to read these messages, all these questions. And we got one from, from Laura and she said, I have a message for Jonathan Mendonca. If you could please pass it along. Yeah, this is cool. I've been following along and listening to the Chooseify podcast for about a year now, but episode 265 talent stacker really resonated with me. My story is so similar to that of Jonathan's. I'm currently in year 12 of a similar grind to what he referenced. After four years of undergrad, four years of vet school, and now almost four years working as a veterinarian, I am burnt out and losing steam. The silver lining is that I am on track to pay off my six figures of student loan debt in March of 2021, the same month that I turned 30 years old. In a way, I feel like I will have a fresh start, even though I feel like I could have been so much further ahead without all of the schooling and loans, and it's a constant regret of mine. Thanks to Chooseify and my own frugality, I do not feel like I need to practice as a vet forever. If I find something else that lights my fire, I feel I will be able to follow it. And I'm so far ahead of where so many of my colleagues are who feel absolutely trapped and burdened by their student loans. Just wanted to say that I'm so happy that you have found another passion outside of pharmacy and that I hope to do the same. Keep up the great work. You are truly making a difference in the lives of other young professionals. The fire is spreading. How awesome is that, John? I love it. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't think people appreciate that how many of us that went into professional programs and took out six figures of student loan debt, and there's millions of us, like we are a large cohort that went into uh, veterinary medicine, pharmacy, law, me uh, medical school. You know, We took out hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loan debt because society told us that if we invested this time and borrowed this amount of money, uh, society would take like it's that that's that that's the exchange of value we'd be good to go uh, we didn't really appreciate how quickly the student loans were were rising the tuition was rising in correlation with the salary that was either flatlining or diminishing and the burden of expectations that was being ever increased three to five percent year over year with less support to help you um it's just been you've just kind of been seeing the margins get slashed for like a decade and now Students going into school in any of these professions are having this awakening probably about three years into their profession that after they pay their taxes and they're in a higher marginal tax bracket and after they pay their student loan bill, there's such a small fraction left over that it doesn't seem like a fair exchange when you see the amount of time that you put in to get there. You know, the, the effect of uh, eight years of commitment, four years of undergrad, four years of your, 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 uh, your professional degree. Um, and the best thing here is having the wake up call and saying like, I'm not going to settle and stretch this out over 20 years. So I can't benefit from it. I'm going to grind this out aggressively. 
Uh, and so like in Laura's case, March of 2021, she is going to complete what I suspect is well over six figures of student loan debt, well over a hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt. She's going to effectively wipe that off. Most people in my pharmacy profession were fine just letting it ride. You're always going to have student loan payments. You're always, that's just, that just comes to you. You're going to take student loan payments to the grave. It's just what you do. Most other professional practice degrees are like that as well at this point. It's a huge contrast from what we found in the in the early 90s and late 80s in these professions where the tuition was nothing or compared to uh, compared to the expected salaries. And so what I want to say is if you want more options in your life, getting rid of the student loan debt is tough. It's not fun, but it is the path forward. So Laura, you have made the right choice. If you decide you want to stay, like I remember I finished paying off my student loan debt. It was documented on the show. It was done. I remember from that point forward, my stress levels disappeared because I realized I had options. I no longer needed to account for a level of income that could cover my life plus the student loan debt, right? And so anybody doing mathematical calculations telling you how you can, you know, keep your student loan debt and you'll probably do better in the market over time, that might be true on paper, but it doesn't account for life options if you want to take a leap, if you want to, if you want to go test the waters and try something, if you want to fail and fail forward. It, it kind of, you always need to maintain this level of income to be able to cover the student loans that you signed up for, you know, back when you were, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. So, um, Laura, like you're making the first step. March, 2021 is the first, you know, day of this next phase in your life. And you get the choice based on value. You know, you might be able to pivot inside your industry to something that you deem less toxic. Brad, I know like this is something that you've advocated for, for a long time. You might totally go rogue like me and say, all right, well, the key is I need to make an above median income. I'm going to build a business on the side until it exceeds that. And then I'm going to pick the more fun one. Or you could take option C, which is what I'm talking about in Talent Stacker. And you're saying, I want to make an above median income. I'm not trying to do entrepreneurship. I just need a high paying job that I don't have to go back to school to get. Great. Let's build our Talent Stack. Let's map out a path to 60, 80, $120,000 a year and beyond within six months. This is totally doable. Um, Brad, I think that's the power of like knowing what your options are, being realistic, but then saying, all right, what is keeping me from fully leveraging the power of the options that are available to me? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds spot on. I mean, I think to me, one of the biggest positives of the FI lifestyle, the FI mindset is having options that otherwise may have been closed to you or more likely, which just were never on your radar screen. Like you never conceived of it because Maybe society led you down a certain path, your family, your expectations led you down a certain path, and you just did not know that that was possible for you. Good, bad, or indifferent, you didn't know it was possible for you. But now you've seen people all across the United States, all across the world, who are taking on these really unconventional decisions and an unconventional lifestyle that, frankly, we think is is the optimal lifestyle, right? It's based on value. It's based on choice. It's based on intentionality. Like this to me should be the default, but sadly it has not been, but we're all making a dent in the world. And I think that's really cool. And you're seeing this spread, right? You're seeing who, who doesn't want more options in their life, right? I mean, it should, this should be patently obvious to everybody. And I love how Laura said, if I find something else that lights my fire, I feel I will be able to follow it. And I'm so far ahead of my current colleagues, right? That's a mindset. That is the mindset of Phi. And that's going to serve you well, no matter what choice you make. For many people, the choice is, all right, I'm going to follow this through. Okay, well, that's fine. But you realize you had options, right? There's no sunk cost anymore. Like for you, Jonathan, you could have sat there and said, wow, think about all the sunk cost in terms of number of years I put into this. And the hundreds of thousands of dollars that I invested in getting this degree and this profession, that could have, have paralyzed you, right? But it didn't. And that's the power of an open mindset. And that's the power of having options. Isn't that fascinating to think about? Like I do sometimes go back to it, but only as like an intellectual academic exercise to point out the opportunity cost of the path that I chose. You know, so here I am on Choose of I talking to you guys each week about optimizing your path to financial dependence, and I can point to a lost decade. I'm doing great. Nobody needs to feel sorry for me, I promise. But I can point to a lost decade that would 
I mean, 10 years can fundamentally trans, uh, change your, your, your financial trajectory. 10 years? You kidding me? If this is your day zero, 10 years from now, you're going to be a different human being with a different financial path altogether if you're on this path with us and you're just taking small action steps. What if we could start 10 years sooner? Well, I can't do that. Okay, well, you should start now. Start now. You can't wait another 10 years before you start taking this seriously, wherever you are. And that's why choose the five is to choose your own adventure, right? It's like, yes, we're not all starting the same place, but we all need to get started. All of us. We cannot afford to wait 10 more years before saying, man, look what the last 10 years actually cost me. Maybe there was something to that thing that they were talking. Yes, there is. Get started. If you are one of Laura's colleagues, you heard this and you're overwhelmed by debt, do not wait 10 years. Have that wake up moment. Start right now. I don't care if you're $5,000 in debt or literally $250,000 in debt. People have had been in worse situations than you and said, all right, I think I need to get started. And they are so glad they did even a year in, even two, you can always, you can always do better than you're doing right now, right? There's a way to optimize for you at any point in time. And you get space that you didn't have before. The cost of inaction is too great. We gotta, we gotta get started. So, uh, Brad, I've had this uh, little note on our kind of list of things to talk about for a while, and I think it's time to finally uh, mention it and can it. Just we should all, I was just thinking we should all have a fun challenge at some point. I'll bring it up maybe one more time in the new year, but I let, you know, we all have, we have these different challenges. And one of them is like the no spend month or, and they have, they go through various, uh, various iterations, mustache November, you know, sort of thing. We do challenges, uh, <laughs> how to get space. Uh, most of us have almost by default done this challenge where we just don't drive our car for uh, nine months now. Uh, giant paper <laughs> Very weights. large paperweight. Large paperweights. Those of us who have actually had this wake-up call, maybe we actually don't need two cars. Like, we could probably just go down to one. I hear all these people saying it, it always seemed ridiculous, but now I'm like, I actually have to remember to go turn it on and drive it. And I always have to then, re you know, it's like, all right, well, maybe we do. Maybe we take 2021 and say, this is going to be our one car year. Um, can you imagine all the used cars that are going to show up on this planet if everybody just made us... And, you know, everybody in this country made this decision. You know what? I think we're a one-car one family plus Uber now. Wow. Used cars are going to be selling uh, at a very low cost, and you might want to get in front of it uh, and, and um, sell yours before all the prices go down. Anyways, that was sidebar. Side for the sidebar. The funny thing, hold on, sidebar, yeah. is that used car prices have actually dramatically increased. I know. Why is that? Why doesn't that map out the lot? Just shows you, you don't know what's going to happen in the market, so just get in the market. Time in the market is better than timing, but I don't understand the logic of that, Brad. Well, I don't know if your uh, your hypothesized thing of people going down to one car has actually come to fruition yet. Maybe that's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt here and say 2021, maybe that'll happen. So uh, yeah. to be continued. Yeah, I don't know. All right, you're right, though. You're right. My hypothesis is wrong there. All right, thanks for calling me out, though. No, not wrong. Not wrong. <laughs> not wrong. You're ahead of your time. I'm ahead of it. I'm ahead of, we're ahead of the curve. It'll catch up <laughs> eventually. Uh, all right, here's my chat. Here's what I was thinking. Have you guys ever heard of this website called Supercook? Not affiliated with Choose the Vi, just a fun little thing that I've I found in the past. And it's still active and it's pretty cool. What if you're sitting on thousands of dollars of groceries uh, and you just never used them because you never used them? What if you could shop your cabinets and create a list of items that you've already paid for, you've already invested uh, dollars into, and you only needed one or two very small inexpensive ingredients in order to really use up your pantry? What if you could say, all right, I don't even care that much, but you know, probably I better optimize this. So let's say you have like 10 items in your, in your, in your pantry. And most of us have hundreds, we, you know, we have eight shelves and they're just all filled up and you just always add the new stuff. You never go and you clean out the old stuff until it's, you realize the expiration date was 2013. Well, let's assume we're talking about non-expired goods. Uh, you had a list of those and you say, is there, could I just add, maybe add one or two extra ingredients and then make like five or six or seven new dishes? Or maybe could I make anything with the ingredients I actually have? Supercook will allow you to inventory your cabinets. Inventory your cabinets. You just easily add a list of all you have. And then it'll say, based on what you have, you could make these five recipes. And if you were willing to add a couple ingredients like salt, pepper, tomato paste, whatever, you could then, that would then unlock all these additional recipes. And it links to basically the entire internet. What if you had a challenge one month and you said, I wonder if we could just get that first thousand dollars. That thousand, you know, we're paycheck to paycheck. We haven't really gotten started. I wonder how much value we're actually sitting on in our cabinets. And you ran through this exercise. You inventoried your cabinets. You inventoried your spice thing. You ran it through Supercook. I believe it's supercook.com. It's also available as an app now. 
And then you gave it a list of what's the minimum number of ingredients you would need to buy to make the maximum number of things. And you just churn through that until your cabinets were finally used up. How much money would that save you compared to how much you spent on groceries last month or the month before? Think about that. Small action might be a little bit of friction to set it all up, but what a win if you realize this month we carved out $500 to $800 in grocery savings because we went through this challenge. Yeah, that's cool. I know this is something that that appeals to you. I feel like you've you've mentioned to me in the background a handful of times over the last year about about this concept. So have you have you done this? And I guess uh, what would be your challenge to people? Like if they're going to do this, should they reach out to us at feedback at chooseify.com and let us know the results? Like what are, what are we looking for? Yeah, here? I like this. So I'm going to do it with you guys uh, either, either the month of December, but we got some holidays coming up or in January, but I'm preparing to go through this challenge again. And when I decide to actually execute, uh, I'm going to create uh, what our results actually were. We actually have a, uh, a, a group called Chooseify Meals and Recipes. It's one of our local groups. You can access it at chooseify.com slash local. And uh, I was thinking for those members that are already there, if you want to do it, why don't you just post in that group, you know, what you're, what, what, that you're trying it and when you're going to try it and what the results of this inventory are and just kind of keep us posted on what's working for you. I'd love to know whether or not this challenge is able to put some money back in your, in your, in your in your wallet. And it's not binary where you only shop your cabinets, but rather we say, we know how much we normally spend. And we also know how many groceries, this is really for just a few of you that know you are guilty of hoarding in your cabinets with no intent to use, right? Why'd you buy it if you were never going to eat it? What if we, what if, what if we actually address that and work through it? What satisfaction we get and how much money could we possibly save? So uh, Brad does this five weekly. Let us know if you're interested in the challenge. I'll be reporting back probably within the next month or so to let you guys know what Danny and I were able to uncover by doing it. But we're taking this on as a uh, as kind of a personal fun family challenge. And we're going to go down the uh, uh, shop your cabinets rabbit hole. Nice. I like it. And Jonathan, it's cool. We haven't really mentioned the uh, Choose of I local groups all that often here in you know 2020. Obviously, it hasn't been the the greatest time to be getting together in person. But I know a lot of our local groups are doing Zoom meetups, even still uh, some socially distanced outdoor like walks and hikes. I know here in Richmond VA uh, that's happened. I actually had an email from David in uh, Brisbane, Australia that said, I thought you might like to know this Saturday is the first Chooseify meetup here in Brisbane. And he said, uh, another guy asked if there are any meetups. They teamed up together to, I guess, start this group and make it happen. So it's just cool to see that, that these local groups are thriving, you know, in their own 2020 way. There is this sense, Brad. I mean, 2020 has been a trying year for all of us. It is still trying all of us, all of us. Like I get that across the board, but there is a sense that 2021 is bringing better things and that we're coming back right? We're coming back and it's going to be so much fun to see you guys at local events like Camp Fies across the country and various meetups, the local groups having their activities again. That brings so much joy to our hearts just to see it. And I know how big community is to all of us. It's re really our reason for existing. I kind of want to let you guys in behind the scenes here that we're working on something right now. This is not the formal announcement, but if you listen to the show every single week, I just kind of wanted to let you know about it. We are thinking about doing a conference next fall, giant meetup, right? Giant meetup. Thinking about doing a conference next fall called the Unstuck Project. Now, location and actual date to be announced. But what I'm trying to say is a lot of variables still unknown. We're still assessing the water, but I, I, it looks very good to me. The Phi community, as a community that puts its emphasis on people and connection, we're coming back. And we're coming back stronger than ever because of what we went through together. And uh, I just hope that's like a tiny little bit of encouragement for you guys, all of us. Let's get started now and let's look forward to a date where we can share our wins, not just by this podcast and not even just by social media, but have a celebration of everything that we've come through together. The Unstuck Project, what do you think, Brad? It has a certain ring huh. to it. Yeah, it does have a certain ring to it. I like that. And, and yeah, I mean, to your point, like, I don't know when this is going to be, but man, is that a cool thing to think about, right? Like it almost, I, you know, I've read articles about how 
like the world is going to experience this almost like roaring 20s type thing of just like worldwide celebrations, you know, once once this does pass. And I mean, that that to me is just such a fun, hopeful thought of, you know, what will community look like when when we can come back? I mean, we're humans, we're social animals, right? Like we crave this. And for a lot of us, this has been, you know, eight, nine months of of really minimal at most social interaction. And yeah, I mean, I just can't wait to see our local groups start thriving again in in the ways that they want, you know, not in the ways that they have to resort to. And yeah, it's cool to think about like a grand meetup like this, you know, to me, conference, the word, you know, it sounds a little too formal, but man, this is just like a grand meetup. And yeah, I think that's a, that's a really hopeful thing. What is another word other than conference? So conference, meetup, collective, like a tent. <laughs> I don't know. Mastermind. I don't, I don't know. The yeah, project. Mastermind sounds good. <laughs> Oh man, it'd be fun. All right, everybody mark your calendars for some, well, Jonathan, you haven't given us a date. I know just keep the entire <laughs> year open and uh, <laughs> we'll stay in touch. All right, Brad, we like to finish every episode by uh, celebrating a win from someone inside the financial independence community. And these wins uh, are collected via our uh, bi-weekly newsletter. So our subscribers get a once a week newsletter from you, basically letting them know what's going on in the community, something that you're personally working through and maybe a challenge and action step each uh, week. And we just ask them, what is the one thing that you took action on? And then we share some of those uh, with the audience. And I believe we have a pretty epic one today, which I will give you the platform to share. Just real quick to individuals, if you want to share your win with the community, be featured on the show and uh, just go to chooseify.com slash start to be a part of the newsletter and to, uh, to, enter this, uh, to enter this giveaway. So Brad, with that, what do you got for us? Yeah, we got a great email here from Josh, and he actually wrote on behalf of his entire family. So it's from Josh, Sheena, and Hayden. And Josh said, hey, Brad, happy Friday. We found your podcast this summer and have been addicted to FI and improving our financial future ever since. Here's what we've been working on in 2020. In April, we turned our detached garage into a finished guest house and listed it on Airbnb. It basically makes enough to cover our mortgage payment each month. In July, we bought our first investment property. In August, I maxed out my 401k for 2020. Also in August, we started contributing all of my wife's income to max out her employer IRA. In September, I started an M1 finance account and have been contributing to that since my 401k has maxed out. This week, we started a Roth IRA for our 15-year-old son, another idea gleaned from your podcast. He works around the Airbnb and the investment. And we are closing on our second investment property in November. Finally, we are avid travelers. So we opened the Chase Sapphire Preferred card and bought some of our recording equipment for our GoPro so that we can start vlogging on our trips. Travel is our passion. So why not share that with others and maybe even generate some income doing it? I'm 44 and this summer was the first time I heard about Phi. I wish it had been 20 years ago. We've always been decent savers, but this is the next level and we are super excited about it. My family is very thankful for the work you guys put in on your site and podcast as it has been huge for us this year. I tell people about your podcast often, and it usually comes with me saying, this podcast changed my life. Thank you. Jonathan, how awesome is that? Wow. Congratulations. On that. You know, we talk about the aggregation of marginal gains. Not a lot of margin there. That's, uh, <laughs> that's huge. Uh, and yeah. it, it is, it really is easy to start really moving outside your 401k and into your M1 taxable accounts when you've been able to look at the problem a little differently and figure out how could I live for free? How could I, you know, not have to have a mortgage payment? What would that actually look like to be able to then solve for that and solution it and consistently bake in those wins? It doesn't take long before those, that 20 year of regret is just a rounding error. You know, it's you're you've got this, you've opened up your entire future. So huge congratulations to you and your family. And Brad, I would just say, I just want to give you one more chance here for people that are doing exactly what was just described and are sharing this with friends and family. I know you, uh, you and I have put some work in to aggregating resources for individuals that are sharing this. I would just say to everyone, um, the, the easiest thing that you can do to get immersed in this content, you know, if you want more control over how you're interacting with this content and you want to find the content that serves you where you are, just go to choosefi.com slash start. All of our resources are there for you. And uh, it is by far the easiest way to find out more about what it looks like to build your path to financial independence. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.